and welcome to the University of Oregon Libraries. For some time, the School of Architecture and Allied Arts, specifically the Department of Art History, and the UA Libraries have wanted to honor the legacy of Marion Dean Ross. Uh, Ross was the first chair of the Art History Department. He was um, a pioneering scholar, a, re a revered teacher, and a generous benefactor. And this year is an, uh, an appropriate time to honor his legacy. It marks the 20th anniversary of a bequest to the university, um, over a million dollars dedicated to the acquisition of library materials. And this bequest also enabled the establishment of the Marion Dean Ross Distinguished Chair in Art History. The commemoration of Ross's uh, achievements includes an exhibit in this library and a series of forthcoming sessions uh, managed by the Art History Department in which faculty will discuss their favorite acquisitions from the Ross Endowment. Today we're honored to have as our featured speaker, Leland Roth, the first Marion Dean Ross Distinguished Chair in Art History. Professor Roth came to the university in 1978 and became Professor Emeritus in 2010. He is recognized internationally for his scholarship, particularly in American architecture, and his publications include core titles such as The Concise History of American Architecture, McKim, Mead, and White Architects, and Understanding Architecture, Its Elements, History, and Meaning. And following the legacy of Ross, Lee has focused in recent years on the architecture of the built environment of the Pacific Northwest and has in the works uh, a book on the history of Oregon architecture and a monograph on the modernist architect, John Yon, whose archives the library recently acquired. So I'm pleased to present to you Lee Roth and his presentation with its intriguing title, Marion Dean Ross, A Man Who Left a Hole in the Water. Lee. Thank you, Ed. Um, I'm very heartened to see such a wonderful audience. Um, and I think a good member, a good number of the audience knew Marion, uh, which makes me feel a little strange. I feel like I'm carrying coals to Newcastle. Um, and actually, um, you know, you always have to pay the piper. So those of you who knew Marion, I'd like to make a request. Uh, we've often thought of doing this, but we never had the opportunity of having so many people gathered together. So the request is this. If you have revealing, interesting, intriguing, humorous stories about interactions you had with Marion, I would very much like to hear them. Uh, either send me an email, uh, write me a letter, uh, care of the Department of Art History, because I'd like to have these collected in a, a manuscript that can be deposited in the library at the school so that these wonderful um, uh, tales don't disappear. Um, I will have a few incorporated in my remarks today, but I know that there are others out there. Uh, please, please pass them on. Some of you, perhaps all of you, may be puzzled by the title of this lecture. So let me explain what it means right away. And this will get us directly into the reason for a lecture on this special occasion on Marion Dean Ross. Someone once said to a friend of mine that if you think you have an impact on the course of history, simply stick your hand into a bucket of water, then draw it out. Did your hand leave a hole in the water? Well, according to the teller of this account, that is about as much impact a person might expect to have on influencing history. But I disagree. I think every one of us, to some degree or other, however imperceptible it might seem to be, 
affects the people we meet and interact with. That is what Clarence endeavored to impress on George Bailey as they stood on the bridge at the edge of Bedford Falls. Without the life and presence of George Bailey, his community would have become the heartless town of Pottersville. People do have a measurable impact on those around them, and teachers especially have a long-reaching impact. As Henry Adams wrote in his autobiography, quote, a teacher affects eternity. He can never tell where his influence ends, unquote. This, is, or this was absolutely true of Marion Ross, who taught art and architectural history here at Oregon for 31 years, from 1947 until his retirement in 1978. And his influence did not end even then, for he was able to teach his noteworthy course on the history of architecture in Oregon twice more before his retirement, a class which I attended myself twice uh, and when I arrived here and which I continue to teach today. Moreover, after retirement, he continued to serve as advisor and consultant in historic preservation across the state. It is impossible to count how many students of Marion Ross are now at work designing buildings, teaching architecture, or working at the preservation of historic architecture who were shaped in the work they do now by his influence and example. Another part of Marion's legacy is the Pacific Northwest chapter of the Society of Architectural Historians, which he established in the early 1950s and whose members voted several years ago to rename in his honor. It is now just over 20 years since Marion passed, and we are celebrating his far-reaching influence because of something that was set in motion by his passing, yet another example of his continuing influence on the teaching of architectural history here at Oregon. What Marion set in motion, as Ed suggested, is a program of book purchases in architectural history that has no exact equal anywhere in this country, most especially in these days of retrenchment and the curbing of ambitions. I'll tell you more about this program in a moment, but first, I think we need to acquaint ourselves, especially the younger folks here, with just who Marion Dean Ross was. For years, considered by many in Oregon and the Pacific Northwest to be the senior figure among architectural historians, as well as a leading figure in the preservation movement, Marion Dean Ross was colorful and choleric, a curmudgeon, an exacting man, a legendary teacher at the University of Oregon. Born in 1913 in Williamsburg, Pennsylvania, Marion Dean Ross was raised by two maiden aunts. In 1935, he earned a Bachelor of Science in Architecture at Pennsylvania State College, what's now Pennsylvania State University, followed by a summer of study at the Universidad Nacional in Mexico City. He then spent two years completing a Master of Architecture degree at Harvard University, where he came under the considerable influence of architectural historian Kenneth J. Conant. But Ross was studying architecture at Harvard when Gropius, Walter Gropius was there, thoroughly reshaping the architectural curriculum at Harvard, most notably by discarding architectural history and introducing European modernism to the United States. While Ross was becoming an architect to learn modernism at its source, he also understood in a fundamental way the importance of knowing the history of his art. In the fall of 1937, Ross began teaching architectural design and architectural history at Tulane University in New Orleans, and he became a registered architect in Louisiana. But he also returned to Cambridge, Massachusetts for advanced study at Harvard during the summers of 1938 and then again in 1940. It was that while at Harvard in the summer of 1940 that Ross was one of a small group that gathered to found the Society of Architectural Historians. His teaching at Tulane, as well as his postgraduate studies, were interrupted by three-year service in the U.S. Army, 1943 to 1946. It was then that he was introduced to Oregon 
at hot, dusty Camp Abbott near Bend. One of those buildings survives, which is now part of Sun River. Following his discharge, he taught architecture for one more year at Pennsylvania State College, 1946-47, before he accepted an invitation to join the faculty of the School of Architecture at the University of Oregon, where he continued to teach until age 65 in 1978. When he arrived at the University of Oregon in 1947, the School of Architecture and Allied Arts functioned as a single faculty body with no departmental divisions. The entire AAA faculty then numbered about 30 people. When separate academic departments were later created in 1963, Ross was appointed head of the Department of Art History, overseeing five other art and architectural historians. Thereafter, he brought in other faculty to build the art history department, laying the foundation for the exceptional department that exists today. In addition, he served as acting dean in the school during 1962-63. During his 31 years teaching at Oregon, Ross offered classes covering the full range of Western architectural history, American architecture, the history of landscape architecture, the art and architecture of Latin America, a unique course on the architecture of Oregon, and even a course on Islamic architecture. After settling in Oregon, Ross returned to Harvard in the summer of 1948 for one additional period of study. He also directed the Historic American Building Survey, known as HABS, or HABS, that researched and recorded buildings in the Great Smoky Mountain region in the summer of 1957. The next summer, he participated in the Harvard Cornell excavations at Sardis. Meanwhile, he was doing a kind of archaeology here in Oregon, for he became deeply interested in the sleepy little town of Jacksonville, working closely with Robertson Collins to have the town declared a National Historic District in 1966, one of the very first such designated historic districts in the United States. Jacksonville had been an early Oregon mining settlement, the biggest town in Oregon for a very brief time in the 1850s. But then in 1884, it was bypassed by the railroad, as had happened in other places, for example, Bruges, Belgium, where the silting up of the Zwin Canal closed access to the sea and to trade. The absence of transportation meant business in Jacksonville shifted to the new town of Medford, Oregon, built by the railroad seven miles to the east. Jacksonville essentially went to sleep resulting in the preservation of virtually the entire town as though it had been encased in amber in 1884. And this was why Ross was so intrigued by it. A few years after the historic district was created there, in the summer of 1971, Ross directed the HAB survey of Jacksonville, creating a record of the town. A confirmed bachelor, Ross apparently never owned a house, in Eugene, he, rented, he lived in rented apartments within walking distance of the campus, one of his early apartments being in the rear portion of the college side inn, the predecessor of today's bookstore, the Ruck store. And I understand it was up there on the second level. Nor did he own an automobile or drive. Ross's sweeping knowledge of Oregon's architecture was made possible through the kindness of friends and colleagues who drove him in crisscrossing the state year after year. Nevertheless, Ross was an inveterate traveler going to Europe nearly every summer, touring widely in the United States, going to Great Britain almost annually, and also visiting Russia, North Africa, the Near and Middle East, the Far East, and Australia and New Zealand. He made at least two journeys completely around the globe. As his student Wallace Huntington later wrote, Ross's travels, dazzling in their breadth, gave him, quote, such an easy knowledge of the man-made world as few can equal, end quote. He was also an accomplished photographer. Shooting in black and white while at Harvard and then shifting to 35, color, 35 millimeter color film, 
in the 1940s. Moreover, he re-photographed buildings around Oregon and elsewhere re during repeated visits to various sites and cities, creating a panorama across time of those areas and their buildings. His slides from around the world form the basis of his considerable architectural slide collection, augmented now by more than 50,000 additional slides donated by Wallace Huntington and others following Ross's death. More recently, from about 2008 to 2010, Ed Teague, the head librarian of AAA Library, had Ross's invaluable slide images digitized and added to the online U of O Library image collection. His images record buildings now gone, such as the previous Lane County Courthouse. Today, a simple Google search of an Oregon building name, such as New Market Theater Portland, for example, will pull up Ross's digitized slide images. Ross's research and writing covered a broad spectrum, beginning with an article documenting his wide range of reading and interests. His early title, entitled 10 Books on Architecture, published in the Journal of the American Institute of Architects in 1950, presented his personal list of seminal books on architecture, including such authors as Jeffrey Scott, Le Corbusier, Satchel Sitwell, Henry Russell Hitchcock, Nicholas Pevsner, Lewis Mumford, John Summerson, and Siegfried Gideon. Actually, his title was a kind of personal quip or professional quip, alluding to the 10 books on architecture by the ancient Roman architect Marcus Vitruvius. Ross also published a brief study of Caribbean colonial architecture in Jamaica, as well as numerous essays on Oregon architecture. Now, a bibliography, I think it's complete, uh, is on a sheet which is uh, on the um, case at the back of the room. So as you're going back for refreshments, if you care to, you can pick one of those up. And if any of you know of Ross's writings and spot an omission, uh, please let me know about that as well. Ross was honored by an American Institute of Architects Langley Fellowship in 1941 and was the AIA Wald Lecturer in 1938 and 39. And he was also a lecturer for the Archaeological Institute of America in 1950, a Fulbright lecturer in Paraguay in 1961, and a lecturer in the John Hayes Fellows Program at the University of Oregon during 1962 to 65. Upon his retirement in 1978, he received special recognition in the publication of a festschrift assembled by his former students, uh, one of whose uh, um, compilers is at the very back of the room now. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Potter has finally uh, made it to the room. Um, and she was largely responsible for that festschrift, as I understand it. In recognition of his unwavering efforts to advance historic preservation in the state, in 1981, Ross was awarded the Distinguished Preservationist Award by the Historic Preservation League of Oregon. This is a, a cropped image of Ross with a number of uh, students, sometime probably around 1955, I think. It's not dated. Those who studied under him or worked with him encountered a remarkable individual who left an indelible impression. Adolescent undergraduate students could be terrified of him of his un because of his unrelenting high standards. I've been told, in fact, just recently, that some student athletes in his class, apparently not from the School of Architecture, I'm glad to say, lobbed eggs through the open windows of his second story apartment in the bookstore as a protest of his hard grading. His former student, Wallace Huntington, later himself an acclaimed landscape architect in the Northwest, described Ross as possessing an intimidating terribilita. He was an extremely impatient man, remembered Huntington. He could be exasperated by a host of things. Bad wine, shoddy scholarship, a misspelled word or an awkward phrase, or architects who couldn't delineate an arch, of cooks who could not prepare a simple meal. Against these things, he raged with ill-concealed contempt. <laughs> so says Huntington. One close friend recently told me that he was asked by his wife not to invite Ross for dinner for his reputation as a person with a discriminating palate had her terrified. 
Well-known Seattle architect John Paul Jones, a student in one of Marion's classes, recalled for me a day in Marion's history class. I'm sorry, I, don't, I could have had a photograph of John Paul, but I don't have one as a student. Jones was diligently making sketches of the buildings being discussed by Ross when Marion chanced to come along the aisle, passing by Jones. Expecting to see detailed notes when he glanced down, Marion grumbled loudly, what are you doing, Mr. Jones? Whereupon, inspired, John Paul replied, learning the history of architecture, sir. <laughs> Somewhat taken aback, I think Ross replied more approvingly, well, all right then. <laughs> Trained as an architect, Marion understood that architecture students learn in more ways than simply memorizing dates, and he offered students the option of submitting a detailed building model instead of writing a written research paper. Building a model of a Gothic church inculcated in the student a visceral understanding of structural action in the building as no memorizing of a photograph could do. These are some of the models that are in the exhibit just in the halls next door. Renowned filmmaker James Ivory, once a student here in Marion's classes, credits Ross with making him keenly aware of the power of the architecture of the past that would later shape Ivory's films. Even years after his student days, former student and subsequent good friend Wallace Huntington could be the recipient of Marion's gruffness. I understood that Wallace was going to try to make it here, but I hadn't seen him arrive. Oh, good, so I feel a little com more comfortable telling you the story then. <laughs> Marion, of course, traveled by train when visiting Europe to study and photograph architecture during the summers. As it happened, on the way north through Italy, Marion and Wallace chanced to cross paths in Naples. Meeting in an outdoor cafe, Huntington offered to provide automobile transport to their joint destination, Rome. Marion inquired what their route would be, whereupon Wallace mentioned a certain highway by n number. Marion withdrew with a road map and studied it. Being, now, being a person who was in Italy specifically to examine the buildings, in a few minutes, Ross returned, flung the map down on the table, and pronounced rather brusquely, just as I suspected, it's all nothing but scenery. <laughs> Always sartorially correct in his conservative dark three-piece suits that he wore fall through spring, spring but donning a lighter seersucker suit in the summer with white suede shoes and jauntily wearing his felt fedora or a straw boater hat in the summer, Ross and his ever-present cigar, cane, and scowl became a legend in the halls and school drafting rooms. Legendary was his formal attire, his suits bought on trips to San Francisco, Vancouver, or London, but legendary, too, was his intellect, for as Huntington remembered in 1978 in the Festschrift, that encyclopedic mind retains such awesome comprehension of fact and verity as to make humble those whose erudition founders in his wake. As a uh, freshly minted assistant professor of architectural history in the early 1970s, I got to know and recognize Marion Dean Ross at the annual meetings of the Society of Architectural Historians. And to be quite frank, even at that distance, I was very intimidated by him. He seemed to be so formidable and exacting, but I also admired and respected him. And because of my doctoral research on New York architects McKimmey and White, I discovered his pioneering article on the early architecture of Oregon published in the Oregon Historical Quarterly in 1957. The newly established firm of McKimmey and White was hired by Henry Villard, in 1882, designed the Portland Hotel in Portland, as well as other buildings for Villard's Northern Pacific Railroad. Sadly, the Portland Hotel is gone, though Marion photographed it. But for his 1957 article, Ross resurrected this contemporaneous 1882 perspective view of, of the hotel that had been published in the West Shore. In the 1950s and 60s, modernist architects all around Ross were blindly and short-sightedly repudiating the history of their art, following, of course, 
the example of Ross's mentor, Walter Gropius at Harvard. Most modernist architects then thought of architectural history as bunk. Marion Dean Ross, however, was part of a small but intrepid and independent group of scholars during those years, including such people as Nicholas Pevner, Erwin Panofsky, Rudolf Wittkover, and Henry Russell Hitchcock, who, as Huntington would put it, quote, rebelled against the rebellion, unquote, and never faltered in their appreciation of and study of architectural history. Now, architectural students in other architectural schools in the 1950s and 60s may have been taught to snicker at the strident color extravaganzas of high Victorian Gothic architecture or, the, uh, or to sneer in derision at the bulbous swelling of mansard roofs of Second Empire Baroque buildings. Ross, however, was a keen admirer of and chronicler of Victorian architecture, so his students here at Oregon were taught to appreciate and value such buildings as the unique evidence and record of their times. This is what Ivory was referring to as Ross's influence on him. In the classroom, as Wallace Huntington observed, Ross's unrelenting and exacting standards opened his, for his students, quote, a destiny that would have been meaner had he not been there. End quote. Now, at the same time, being just as observant a student of contemporary architecture in the Northwest, Ross maintained close friendships with such acclaimed local architects as Pietro Beluski and John Yon. Ross insisted, as he told me, that Yon had to be included in the comprehensive four volume Macmillan Encyclopedia of Architects, twisting the arm of the encyclopedia's editor, his friend, Adolf Plotchek, the librarian of the esteemed Avery Architectural Library at Columbia University, to include an essay on Jan, which Marion wrote. Ross's many friends in his professional world included such East Coast luminaries as Adolf Plotchek and Henry Russell Hitchcock, who was arguably the most important American critic and architectural historian of the mid-20th century. During his periodic visits to the Pacific Northwest in the 1950s, Hitchcock was taken by Ross to visit the best examples of Oregon architecture, both the very old and the very new, in equal measure. This photograph by Ross shows Hitchcock, and he's rec I, I recognize him because of his Hamburg hat and his clipped white goatee. And he's standing in front of the Key Bar Logging Supply Building in Portland sometime in the mid-1950s. The photograph is not dated. A time when these cast iron buildings were being wantonly demolished left and right. And this Ross image shows Hitchcock standing on the terrace of John Yon's remarkable Portland Visitors Information Center in its original condition before the Columbus Day storm of 1962 damaged the delicate pergola. Now, Hitchcock, who taught at Smith College and later at New York University, had years earlier fallen victim to the efforts to attribute Jan's groundbreaking and trend-setting Watsik House, which you see here, the courtyard of it, um, to attribute this design to Pietro Bluski. In writing about the Watsik House in 1940, in fact, Hitchcock was convinced that he saw evidence of, quote, the fine Italian hand of Bluski, end quote. A decade later or more, however, Ross made sure that Hitchcock personally met Jan in Portland and learned the truth. In fact, here you see uh, Hitchcock with his back to us um, observing the, uh, the Swan House by Jan. After being taken by Ross to visit several Jan houses in Portland, in a subsequent personal letter to Jan, Hitchcock wrote that now, having truly experienced the, these houses that he had previously known only through photographs, he was persuaded that compared to Beluski, Jan was the better architect. We in art history and others across AAA were all saddened to learn in 1991 of Marion's passing. Several months later, it came as a wonderful surprise to us to learn that Marion Ross had bequeathed virtually his entire estate valued at over $1.2 million to the Department of Art History. 
Part of his estate, in fact, included a coal mine in Pennsylvania, though we discovered later that it had been exhausted. <laughs> Marion's instructions in his will were that his estate was to be liquidated and invested with the income, as he very clearly specified in his will, to be given to the Department of Art History strictly for the purchase of books and drawings to be placed in the U of O Architecture Library. These books on the history of architecture and related arts that Marion had covered in his classes were to be recommended by the faculty of the art history faculty. Moreover, having spent many years in academic institutions and knowing how funds are sometimes creatively diverted, Ross further specified that this new income was to be used strictly as a supplement to the regular normal state appropriations for book purchases. While this endowment, of course, fluctuates with the cycles of the market, the influx has made it possible to add over 1,400 rare books, as well as many slide images uh, to the Architecture and Allied Arts Library over the past two decades. So Marion's legacy continues in many ways. In the continuing work of his many former students, in the continuing expansion of the Architecture Library funded by his request, I would propose that Marion Dean Ross was definitely a man who left a hole in the water. The question now is when will the architecture library run out of room for all the special rare books that his gift has brought and continues to bring to Oregon? As it happens, our dean, Francis Burnett, who is here today, and our architecture school department development staff, uh, whose members are also here today, are busy recruiting donors to support the creation of a new building for the School of Architecture and Allied Arts to be started in the year of our school centennial in 2014. My recommendation to the yet to be identified architects is to keep in mind Marion Ross's most generous gift. Be sure to make the archive room for these special books very large. In a riff on the guidance given by architect Daniel Burnham a century ago, I would offer this advice. Make no little plan. It must have space for Marion's books. Thank you. Thank you so much. I guess I could answer questions, although the people who really can answer the questions are scattered around the audience. I did not mention the cane. Uh, Marion was run down by an automobile uh, just about a block away from his apartment uh, in sometime in the mid-60s. If any of you know the precise date, let me know. Uh, and use that cane um, ever after. Although I think to a very great degree he recovered from that accident. Um, I also um, smashed up my leg very badly in 2000, but I no longer use the cane. Although, actually, come to think of it, I might want to bring it back because it's, <laughs> that's a very effective tool. He actually would smack the side of the lectern to tell the projectionist, next slide, please. He did that with his cane. I have remote control, so I don't have to worry about that. But I thought I would just explain that because uh, I, I, you saw it in the pictures, and I hope you were able to spot, spot the uh, almost ever-present cigar in the various pictures. Yeah. I often wish that we had had that cane. We could have gotten it from his, his executors and mounted it in a glass case in the library. That would have been a nice touch. I don't know where it went, though. Yes. Sorry? I don't know where it was originally. Um, by the time I came, he was in uh, one of the offices just down the hall from our department office. But any of you know who knew him earlier, can you... Say where his office was? Right down from the old, uh, north of the old uh, library. Where the oh. Library was. We couldn't see it in that view that I showed earlier because it would have been uh, beyond that. Sorry? Northwest corner. Northwest corner. 
Yes. Really? Oh, yes. Well, that's another reason why it would be nice to have in the library. Yes, in the back. <laughs> I'm sure it would. I have no idea. I have no idea. I was just going to say, um, you could find all of his offices if you just went and used your nose. <laughs> the cigar smoke would still be there. I had an office next to him and I yeah. smoked cigars for several years. <laughs> Including the slide room. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It was a different time then. <laughs> uh, Otto. I knew Mary quite well and was around when he got hit by a car. And he did recover. And I'd ask him about the cane. I keep saying, Marion, do you need this anymore? And he said, no, but it's very effective. <laughs> and he would play on that cane like crazy. I mean, yeah. If he came into a room, he wouldn't just slam on the lectern. He would slam on the desk and wake everybody up after the, after the, the lights came back on, after the slide, the architectural history. He wouldn't give that cane up for the world. I think it became his personality. Right. Yes? I think I'm serious about the suggestion. Could the collection be put in this room? There's a whole lot of space for the uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe somebody should do a calculation of how much it could be put in here. And it could be that Mary wants or I'll be in the top one. Sounds like a question for Ed. <laughs> Well, please avail yourself of the uh, refreshments at the back of the room. Thank you, Lee. I do want to add that we did find a, a cassette tape of a Ross lecture from 1988 uh, given at the Maud Kern Center uh, about Eugene Houses, and that is accessible through the University of Oregon Library Scholars Bank, our digital repository, and um, it is identified in our exhibit out there too. That, um, that reminds me that the second time that Marion, uh, and the last time that Marion taught his class in Oregon architecture, we videotaped the entire series and audio taped the entire series. Um, those tapes are in the uh, AAA library. They're not? Okay, I'll, I'll get you some. I'll get you some. Um, if anyone is interested, those could probably be put on, uh, on, uh, um, uh, VA, uh, on um, they're, of course, they're VHS tapes, but they could be burned onto uh, DVDs. Uh, yeah, that would be a much more stable, I think, much stable uh, uh, medium. But uh, that is recorded. <laughs>